let's work on some strats. Yes, the Morris Part 2 video will be coming soon, but uh, I have to wait for finish to dry and stuff like that. Making a neck is not a two-day process. Maybe it'll be next week, maybe the week after. Anyway, I say strats, but this is actually a PV. Now, PV is mostly known these days for amplifiers, and for good reason. But they had a long run making guitars as well. I think they still might be importing some. Anyway, the company was founded by Hartley Peavy in his hometown of Meridian, Mississippi in 1964 or 65, depending on your source. His parents ran a music store, and Hartley got involved in making his own amps while he was a teen, and also sort of retrofitting guitars and stuff. Hartley is a contentious kind of guy. He didn't like the fact that Fender and Gibson would force their dealers into carrying what he considered kind of second-rate amps in order to have access to their guitar line. So in other words, if you wanted to sell a guitar, you also had to sell their amps. He felt that was kind of unfair, and he felt that Fender got away from their origins a little bit and what had made their early stuff so great. And by the 1970s, he considered their designs well, kind of unsuited to the demands of modern musicians. In the same way, he felt that American-made guitars were overpriced and understood that the rise of Asian manufacturing was going to take a big bite out of the market. In the mid-70s, he did a very forward-looking thing and invested heavily in CNC technology, some of the first stuff on the market. So he had that speed and accuracy on his side years before Fender. He could market an American-made product that was between like 40 or 50 percent less. So where American Strat was retailing for a thousand bucks, his guitars were 500. Now I'm not saying they're on par in every way. Uh, the neck on this is laminated from two pieces, for instance. That's not necessarily a bad thing either. But there were some really nice PVs out there and they were a whole lot of bang for your buck. As a businessman, Hartley could ruffle some feathers. Uh, he had this kind of protectionist mindset. For instance, he noticed that Korean-made instruments enjoyed a kind of privileged position, trade-wise, in the U.S. There was no import duty on them, where there was on, say, Japanese goods. So he got some lawyers and petitioned, and he had the government take away that little perk. And as you can imagine, companies that were marketing Korean lines, like Epiphone, etc., that was a bit of a surprise. It's like, oh... We'll pay another 7% on something this year that we hadn't expected. Later on, of course, you know, he actually took his business overseas, too, for production and closed his Mississippi plant and one in the UK. So that's, you know, he's a businessman. During the 80s and 90s, PV went into keyboards, electronic drums, all kinds of avenues. He got in good with Mr. Edward Van Halen and was producing the 5150 amps and the Wolfgang guitars, which were pretty cool. There's a lot of good stuff to be said about PV. I've always hated their logo. So this is a Falcon, made in 1987. Sort of a Strat with slightly different body shape. Uh, simplified controls. It was one volume, one tone. We're just going to do a standard setup on this. This was the owner's father's guitar and uh, he's unfortunately passed away, so we're going to tune it up and uh, get it into good playing condition. So I'll start off with the usuals. The action height at the 12th fret is around 6 64ths on the bass side, uh, 5 64ths on the treble, and it's quite inconsistent um, on the strings between those. So a little high. Neck relief was a little bit high at around 15 thousandths. Interesting truss rod cover. The plastic has been molded into the curve of the transition between the headstock and the neck. It's held on with a screw. That's interesting. Rather than a hex nut, it's got uh, a Gibson style acorn nut. Don't see that on strats very often. So this is in fact a 5 16 same as a Gibson. It was fairly loose. Get a good snug up. See what that does. 
And with some adjustment, the relief is now around six thousandths, which I think is fine for right now. And the action is now down to about five on the bass side and four sixty-fourths on the treble, which is closer. You'll know, plug in and see if the electronics function. Pot's a little dirty. Yeah, that definitely needs cleaning. This bridge is floating quite a lot. There's a steep angle and the back edge is off the top of the body by a substantial amount. This is for people who want a serious amount of upbending capability with their uh, whammy bar. You know, like a tone and a half or something for those screaming pyrotechnics. Um, it's a bit much for your average player of today, so I'm going to lower this a bit and straighten it out slightly. One fun thing I've noticed about PVs is the hole in the back cover plate actually aligns with the string holes. Don't see that very often. That's a little more what we're looking for. Still a little bit of room for pulling up, but it's not exorbitant, and when you rest your hand on it, you're not going to be pulling it sharp. That's brought the action down to about four and a half on the bass side, four on the treble, which is getting pretty close to what we want. Now I can take the strings off. Inside has all the usual stuff in the usual places. I'm using some electronics cleaner, also known as contact cleaner, available in the electronics section of uh, any automotive supply store. Spray some into the pots and work them back and forth. That'll get rid of any uh, grunge. Speaking of grunge, the um, frets had not been cleaned in a very, very long time. We'll polish those up. Here you can see the before and after effect. It makes a difference when you play. Okay, let's put some strings on this. Interesting situation this time in that the owner of this guitar has a nickel allergy. And that can pose some issues when you're into electric guitars because there's a lot of nickel involved in these things. Uh, many vintage style bridges and hardware, etc. This bridge is actually chrome plated, which is nice. Um, but fret wire, too. Standard frets are made from an alloy containing about 18% nickel. Different people have different degrees of sensitivity, but I've run into this before and I've actually had to refret guitars with stainless steel. In this case, I've ordered some D'Addario Pro Steels, which have a stainless alloy rather than nickel in the wraps. But we do what we can. These, uh, to my ear, they're really bright strings. Uh, oh, they are the brightest, it even says in the package. Yeah, they are, they're almost ice picky. So let's hope the tone control works on this guitar nice, you know. We might have to put a different cap in it or something. But they can be, you know, if you have no choice, you're going to play what you can, right? Just stretching the strings here. Um, really what I'm doing is like tightening the wraps around the uh, tuners and also making sure that the ball ends are seated firmly in the uh, inertia block. Um, but it does help keep things in tune. Roughly adjust the saddle height here. As it turns out, the factory setting for intonation, or string length, is bang on, really, for 10 to 46 strings. Didn't have to change it. I'm going to set the pickup height. You can get that from Fender's website. They give you various specs for various pickup combinations. Um, I usually start with somewhere around 3 30 seconds of an inch. And it much depends on whether they are flat pull pieces or staggered. Uh, certain pickups have greater magnetic pull and they have to be farther from the strings.
And here we have a Fender. I think it's one of their road-worn guitars. I did some work on this about a year ago, I think. I didn't immediately recognize it because it has a different guard. I think it was black before. The owner switched it to this creamy color. And uh, I guess we're in a search to find the proper kind of, you know, guard to go with this antique looking um, sunburst finish. So we're going to try to swap that for a white. This is a, a relict white, obviously. And um, do a little bit of shielding on that. We'll have a look at some of the relicking here. I'm not sure if this is from the custom shop or if someone else did it because well, it's in a funny place. I usually associate the wear marks with being closer to the fret. These are up in like the opposite location. That's funny to me. But the body's a nice piece of ash. See how much cord they gave us to play with here. Not a whole lot. You rascals. There should be enough that you can flip the guard over. Oh well. That's interesting. Someone's used like Teflon plumber's tape to bush out the tops of these uh, knobs. Here's some copper foil shielding tape. I use this stuff from Stuart McDonald. You can find other suppliers online that unfortunately don't have an adhesive that is conductive. So you have to solder or solder across each line um, in your tape and that's kind of annoying. So spend a little bit more for the good stuff. And on the interior I'm using the remnants of my uh, water-based shielding paint. I had just enough left to do the inside of this thing. And again we'll clean the pots. Now I know these parts all came out of here. But they seem to be refusing to go back in. I don't relish the idea of having to do this wiring over. No. That is a Chinese jack. See, these leads were cut like three quarters of an inch too short. Oh yeah, there is the fact that this one is in backwards. That could hurt. I couldn't leave it alone. I had to clean up the wiring, which entailed splicing on a little bit of extra length for every single lead and all of the ground wires, wrapping them with heat shrink, etc. Here I'm twisting each pair of leads, which gives some small amount of noise cancelling, though I'm not sure how much it actually does at these voltages, but it also keeps them neat and tidy. Little cable ties are also a big help. There. It's not the absolute neatest, but it'll be much easier to work with. Redoing the ground wire connection to the tremolo claw. I have to break out the big heavy duty iron for this kind of thing because it takes a lot of heat. And you really want to hold things in place nice and steady while it cools off as well for a good joint. Reconnecting the leads to the new jack in a slightly neater fashion. I'll put some heat shrink tubing on those as well as a precaution. It also acts like a bit of a strain relief. Now, what do we always say about retrofitting an aftermarket Strat pickguard? Hey, just, just put on a pickguard. No. No. As soon as you put that word just into the sentence, all bets are off. Because they never, ever fit properly. I'm missing a screw hole here. And there's a screw hole under here that should be there that isn't in the pickguard. And it fits okay-ish. It, it's not a drop-in replacement. It never is. Disavail yourself of that notion. 
Some slight interference happening here. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. All right. And just keep going. Should have suspected something with the tape. I mean, would you look at this one? Come on. Like, really? Okay, I think that's enough strat for a while. Put some 11 to 49s on this. Fairly beefy strings. That's the way he likes it. And, uh, yeah, other than that, the setup I did on it last year is still holding, so nothing else to do. This was just replacing a pick guard, remember? So, yeah, let's plug it in. Thank you.